appreciate art and just know that art is sometimes hard to articulate, especially the importance of art. But in times of struggle, in times of happiness, in every single like moment of transcendence, you were probably doing something artistically related. All right, welcome everyone to the show. Happy Monday. This is the What You Don't Hear podcast. Uh, unless you're listening to this not on a Monday, then better late than never, I suppose. But thanks for being here. Either way, I am your host. My name is Ross Tyson. I am an Ohio native that now calls the creative city of Columbus his home. I'm a creative director, a brand builder, a guy who likes yellow. I'm a maker and doer of many things. But most importantly for this, I'm a podcaster and a person who loves to talk a whole heck of a lot. Now, definitely the coolest thing about getting to do this show is meeting new people. Now, especially for an introverted person like myself, and I know what you're thinking when I say that, right? You're maybe saying, Ross, you talk so freaking much all the time. You post all these things all over the internet. You never, ever stop. You never quit talking. How can you call yourself introverted? And you're right, but it's true. And I've never really been one um, to go out and, and really like be involved in things that happen here in Columbus, to be honest. Um, I often pass up going to networking events or festivals here in town because I just usually just like don't have the energy um, to really like go out and, and be involved in those things. So extroverted I am not, but thankfully the safety of this podcast allows me to get to meet people whenever I want. And more importantly, people who I know are ready to have a fun, deep dive of a conversation. And that is actually how I met this week's guest, Lydia Simon. Now, I honestly don't think I would have met her, um, at least anytime soon, if this show and this podcast wasn't a thing. Um, so, you know, even though I would likely have had many opportunities to meet her in a non-pandemic world, because Lydia is a part of the growing creative community here in Columbus. Um, she is the executive director over at Wild Goose Creative. And in this episode, as we segue into it here, uh, we get to learn all about that. We get to learn all about Wild Goose, what she does, what the community is like here in, here in Columbus, um, how she lived in China for a while and even almost got kicked out of the country at one point in time. Um, there is so, so much that we dive into here as I get to know Lydia. Um, so let's just get into it. It's episode 31 of What You Don't Hear. Without any further ado, let's dive in. Here is my conversation with Lydia Simon. So if you're ready to dive in, I'm ready. let's just get to it. Let's so it. Lydia, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I am very, very excited to get to know you. This is our first time meeting it is. ever. So it is. I appreciate you being down to like come on the show and, and get to know somebody on a podcast. Obviously. I mean, that's a great opportunity. And who doesn't kind of love to talk about themselves, honestly? It's honestly a, a very fair I statement. Mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people who <laughs> listen or watch this podcast and are like, Nobody likes talking more than Ross. So, yep, <laughs> yep, there's another episode that he has. But no, I, I'm very excited to get to know you um, because I can't even remember how I came across you. I know it was on Instagram. Um, it was actually, it was, um, you did Gab Street podcast. Yes, that's right. And I had, I had checked that out and I was like, okay, now I need to talk to her. Like that's now awesome. I want to get to know you. So you are the executive director of Wild Goose Creative. Yes. yes. yes now, before we rolled on the podcast, we already had delved into all the art direction talk and creative direction talk. We were talking about all that sort of stuff. You have the yellow earrings, which I loved on brand. I got these at um, this, oh my gosh, I totally forget the name, but it's this really cute boutique on Indianola. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Where, um, oh man, yeah, where that movie theater is. I Anyway. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, they're really cute. But well, thank you. I love that you planned and you are on brand with it. That is <laughs> when you told me that when you got here, I was like, that's perfect. I know. That I was is the debating best thing. between these and the red ones, and I'm like, I'm going to do the yellow ones. I <laughs> love it. So, executive director, Wild yes. Goose Creative, how, like, what led you there? How, how did you get with Wild Goose? So, I received my bachelor's degree in arts management from Ohio State, and I have always been interested in and fascinated by the arts. 
Um, it is an environment where I feel comforted, but also challenged. And my parents are both artists. So my mother, she was previously the lead soprano for the Cleveland Opera. She now trains Broadway stars at Baldwin Wallace Theater or Baldwin Wallace College, um, which is insane. And my father is a fine arts professor and a jazz violinist on the side. My grandparents, my um, grand, my papa was a well-known jazz pianist in New York City, and his wife, my granny, was a jazz singer. So I grew up in the arts. Like that's what I know and what I I feel so gravitated towards. Um, but I knew that I didn't want to be an artist. You know, like you want to kind of do something a little bit different than your family. Mm -hmm. And I always kind of felt like, I don't want to say I liked the business side of things, but I was interested in it. I felt curious about it. And so when I was figuring out what I wanted to study at Ohio State, besides Chinese, which I'm sure we'll get into that later, um, I came across arts management and I'm like, this is perfect. This is the business side of the arts. This is fascinating. And then, so I started taking classes and, and a lot of it, it was entrepreneurship based and um, accounting, finance, things like that, but also classes related to arts policy and fundraising and marketing and just, and things like that. Um, so it, it was a relatively new program. Arts management is a, is a fairly recent field. Uh, and because of the demand, I guess, for, for this type of thing. Um, and then I got an internship at a gallery downtown, and I just was like, I need to, this is what I want to do. So, long story short, before I left to do my master's in Beijing, I volunteered at Wild Goose for an event. Um, it was my first time volunteering. And then when I got back from China, I was like, I, I just didn't, I was figuring out what I wanted to do. And um, do I stay in China? Do I come back to Columbus? And my network was here. I felt like there was just, there's so much creativity. There's so much energy. I felt that I needed to come back here and honestly be become a part of the fabric of the art scene. I told myself, I was like, if I come back from China, like if I don't stay here and find a job, then I'm going to do this in Columbus. And it was just the perfect timing because there was an operations manager position that opened at Wild Goose at the time. And I took that. Um, it was part time at first, so I had another job, but I stuck with it. And it's been three and a half years that I've been with Wild Goose and I've been the executive director for a year and a half. And it's just been like the perfect platform to grow my career and a crash course in arts management because, you know, I have my hand in so many different things all the time. So um, it's it's been really fascinating. And the best part about it is the people that I meet. So, yeah, I mean, I basically volunteered once and then I made a connection with the previous executive director. And, uh, yeah, so that's how. Okay. Yeah, so there's, okay, so there's, there's so lot. many there's things lot, that I yeah, want to lot. dig in there. So, okay, first... <laughs> Maybe for anybody who's not familiar with what Wild Goose is. Yeah. Lay out, what, give, give us the yeah, explanation. Yeah. So Wild Goose Creative is a nonprofit community arts organization. We've been around since 2008. And our mission is really to build a creative community in Columbus, Ohio. So we offer normally, non-COVID times, over 320 events a year, creative events a year. And we're all about accessibility the majority of our events and programs are $10 or less. Um, and what we seek to embody is the encouraging the process of art. So a lot of artists have gotten their start, their careers have started at Wild Goose, whether it be their first gallery show or their first performance. I mean, there are so many stories of people in Columbus that are doing amazing things that have a connection to Wild Goose. Like you'll be very surprised how many people have done stuff there. Um, so, you know, we're a very nurturing environment where it's like we really do say yes to everything. If you have a cool idea, you have a pop-up show you wanna do, you have a fashion show or something, like we will help you, um, you know, we, we subsidize the cost of rent for artists. So if you wanna rent the space, it's at a very discounted rate. And we provide like, you know, we can help you with marketing and help 
that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, we do a lot and we're very multidisciplinary. So the visual art piece is 10% of what we do, our gallery. Then we've got performing arts, comedy, theater, dance. Um, and yeah, we, we are a creative space that uh, really seeks to uplift artists and provide resources. Um, because, you know, we do believe that a career in the arts can be accessible and can be achievable um, with the right support. So, yeah. So, so clearly, I mean, obviously you believe that and, and Wild Goose believes that, I sit here, I believe that. But almost one of my biggest questions is do you feel like that is just, like just recently started to be a transition maybe in like society where people are like, oh, yes. Like, even though we've been seeing examples of it for years, sure, a career in the arts is actually oh, a viable thing. Yeah, I, I, that's interesting that you asked that. I don't really know if more people now feel like it is a viable thing, but I do know that oftentimes in art school, especially like fine arts um, majors and things like that, that you, that it's, artists aren't really taught to look at their art as a product. But if you, and depending on what your goals are as an artist, you need to set that up at the beginning. Like, are, is my goal to make this my full-time job? Is my goal to have this be a side thing? Like, you have, first of all, you need to figure out what you want to do. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's really surprising how, because the thing is, it's like, it is your product. You are an entrepreneur to an extent. Like, if this is your, so... A lot of what we offer, especially in our programs like Business of Art, is um, per allowing artists to kind of look at their art as more of a product. Um, so that, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't know, but I do know that in Columbus, we there's so many artists that are living and making work here, and like making it happen. Yeah, which I think is what makes Columbus so cool and unique. Because I think that the creative scene is very, very similar to the entrepreneurial scene here. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost mirrored mm -hmm. in my mind. Yes, I think. definitely agree. Yeah. Now, uh, so are you from Columbus? I'm from Cleveland. Cleveland? Yes. Okay, yeah. so born and raised in Cleveland and then moved to Columbus. Born and raised in Cleveland, moved to Columbus. The art scenes are different, for sure. I mean, I think Cleveland is more um, well known for the high arts. So the museum and the orchestra are very, you know, world renowned. Not that our institutions here aren't, but I think that there is a little bit more of like a an underground art scene in Columbus, at least from my, you know, from my understanding. Right, right. So taking us back a little bit, you explained earlier that you, I mean, you have been surrounded by artists forever mm -hmm. in some form. Yeah. What was growing up like? Was it just always just filled with just all this creativity? Like, take me back. Yeah. So, I mean, I grew up listening to my mom practice, um, whatever concert she had coming up or, or, you know, well, like I, I just, I, I have that, that image in my mind of, of her just practicing like somewhere like up in the attic or in the basement and my dad constantly practicing his violin like constantly he is such a hard worker and um you know just the the scales and all of that I mean he I don't know if you know any other jazz violinists but it's a very niche thing that he does and it's so cool and he's in like five bands in Cleveland and it's it's amazing um and I think probably the the most robust memories I have of growing up was when we used to visit my family in my grandparents in New, in New Jersey they lived right next to New York City and uh we would have jam sessions where my papa would play the piano phenomenal jazz pianist like insane and my dad would be riffing on the violin my mom would sing my granny would sing I would be like dancing around um so yeah I mean it's just like it was so natural like I it just felt it's always been a part of me um and you know what's funny is I went to a private school for eight years and when I was in middle school I was like oh why can't my parents be like everybody else's parents, you know, why can't they be doctors or lawyers or whatever? And, um, and then in, 
in high school, I was just like, wait, no, my parents are absolutely the coolest, the coolest. So I just brag about them all the time. That is awesome. Um, yeah. And then I actually did some theater. Like I grew up doing theater. That was kind of my thing. And there was a moment there where I thought I might want to pursue that um, because I love the stage. But I realized that that really wasn't for me. And that's kind of where the Chinese part came in, which... I don't okay. know if you want to get into that yet. <laughs> so, okay, okay. So I do want to dive in, but something something you said in there is so interesting to hear, and like the perspective of you're surrounded by all these. I mean, different. I mean, I guess types of culture, technically, of of different arts, and and there's yeah. music and all this sort of stuff. But as a kid, you were like, "Why can't my family just be normal?" Like yeah. that. That's such an interesting thing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, weird. as a kid, we you know, yeah, you think differently than you do now. But I honestly wouldn't have. Because me hearing that, I'm like, oh my God, I feel like me as a kid, I would have been so stoked if everyone was... Yeah, and I mean, like, I definitely appreciated of course, it, but there, yeah. was, uh, there was a moment, I, I know, in middle school where I just, you know, it, it was just so different. And now I'm just like, wow, I, I, I don't know any other parents whose parents are as cool as mine. Like, right. literally. I mean, so... Yeah, it's, you know, when you're a kid, you're weird. Of course, of course. And then you said, obviously, as you got older, you were like, oh, wait. Oh, yeah. This is super dope. Yeah, so So dope. So for you growing up, there was always pretty much a goal of getting into the arts in some way. Like, was there ever any deviation of you were like, I do want to be a doctor. I really want to, you know. Yeah, the deviation was when I started learning Chinese. I mean, I I thought for a second that, you know, I would work for some corporation or government agency or something. And Chinese kind of became my art form in a way because it was it was my way of differentiating from my from my family, but also still kind of staying in that artistic realm mm-hmm. because I felt like Chinese to me. I mean, obviously you have the written text, very artistic in in the written form, but I was really attracted to the speaking of Chinese and the tones because I loved to sing and I felt like of all the aspects of Chinese, that was the aspect that I was the best at and that I just kind of like excelled in. And so that's, yeah, that's kind of where I, um, I thought maybe I, I, and honestly up until I finished my master's, I didn't really know if what I was going to do with Chinese. Now I am doing absolutely nothing with it, but it was the best thing I ever did in my life. Hands down the best Thing I have ever done for myself is get a master's in Chinese. Yeah, I mean, that's... Hands down. To me, I mean, just hearing all this right now, I'm like, I don't think it matters if you're doing anything with it or not. You know it and you experience exactly. that. Exactly. I, that I, like, I know. I like how I, I'm facing a problem that I don't know how to solve and I'm like, hmm, well, I did write 80 pages fully in Chinese. So if I can do that, then I can do this. For real. That, that I have is, to tell myself that yes, sometimes. Yes, that is an awesome bar to have set of like, <laughs> if I can do this, yeah. then great, I can solve this. So what led you to, to be so interested in learning Chinese? Well, uh, my high school offered it and I never took a language in middle school. And I was like, I should just jump on this opportunity. And um, it was extremely difficult. It wasn't until probably my second or third year of college that I was actually able to have somewhat of a conversation with someone. I mean, it took years to learn Chinese. And I had four years in high school. And even though I had four years, I still had to, to place like in, in college and I placed in level one. Um, it was really sad, but yeah, I don't know. It just like kind of became my thing. I always like to do things that are a little different and, um, nobody in my family had done it. I honestly, I think what really got me into it was when I was younger and we would visit my grandparents in New Jersey, we would go to New York city every year and we go to Chinatown and I was obsessed. I I would go to all of the little like fake shops and I would bargain and barter with them. If I saw like a little outline of a back room, I would like try to get into the back room so that I could get all of like the Gucci and the Prada and the coach. So honestly, like my (laughs) initiation into Chinese culture (laughs) was via Chinatown in New York City. And then I got to the point where I could do that in Chinese. And I was like, okay, this is cool. 
Yeah. Um, and they gave me even better deals because they're like, oh, wait, you're actually you're actually trying to bargain in Chinese. Like what? I would um, feel so cool if I could. I like... know. <laughs> but when you actually but when you try it in China, though, they're like they are they really try to. Yeah, it's 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 hard. It's harder there. But right, um, right. so, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned private school. Yeah. But then you switched to. What was high school like? Public well, school? I what? was no. I went to an all girls school from eighth grade to twelfth grade. Okay. So I was there the whole pretty much the whole time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I went to OSU. Do you, was there like a trend? Do you feel like there was a transitionary period of like was there a difference in the schooling systems that you were like oh wait this is kind of an adjustment because that's that's always an interesting thing. You mean from like um, from grade school to to y- the yeah, yeah yeah I mean definitely I. Um, I mean, Hathaway Brown is one, honestly, one of the best girls schools in the nation. So I am so blessed to have been able to go to HB. Um, Cleveland actually has some amazing non-affiliated, non-religiously affiliated private schools. So I'm, I'm so blessed that I could go, but yeah, I mean, definitely. Like, I think that what's amazing about HB was that it's, it was high challenge, but high support. So, and it was very much a college preparatory school. So, yeah, I mean, you are obviously paying a lot of money, um, uh, you know, to, to set yourself up for success. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, I credit a lot of my success to HB and the women and like just, um, being in that environment and Chinese. Right. If I hadn't gone to HB, I wouldn't have taken Chinese. Like, because there were no other schools at that time offering Chinese. It was... This was in 2008, 2008, I think, that I started. Oh, my gosh, maybe not. I have no idea. So long ago. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I just had some really great opportunities afforded to me through HB. So walk me through. You said you went to China, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So tell me all about that because yeah. that sounds fascinating. <laughs> so um, so I decided to, the when I, I came to Ohio State because of their Chinese master's program, it's one of the top Chinese master's programs in the country. And so that was actually the main reason why I came to OSU. Um, and so from the get-go, I knew that I wanted to do this master's program. And I graduated from that in 2017. And so along, okay, so first of all, the Chinese, the Chinese um, department is is very rigorous at OSU. So, I mean, I learn Chinese fast because it's all performance based. So, every single day you've got class and every single day you have to memorize a dialogue and then you have to perform that dialogue in front of everybody. And then you do drills where the teacher calls on you and you have to, you know, respond or you are watching, this was the hardest thing. You you're watching um a movie or something and you have to narrate as the movie is playing. I still like have nightmares about that. Um, yeah. So, so it was, it, I learned Chinese fast and throughout the undergrad experience, I went to China pretty much every summer for two months um, at a time. The first time was really hard. I thought to myself, I'm like, is this even the right career path? What am I doing here? This is so uncomfortable. Um, and then I, you know, kept going and I just started to fall in love with the country. I couldn't, I noticed my Chinese getting better. And then, so for the master's program, the first year is at Ohio State and the classes are all based on like, you are ex- expected when you graduate to work in China in Chinese. So it's all about doing business in China, negotiating in Chinese, um, just a lot of things like that. And you choose your own research topic. So everybody had a different research topic. And mine was in regards to contemporary, well, I loved Chinese contemporary art. Um, and But I was looking specifically at two arts districts in Beijing because I find arts districts to be fascinating and the ecology of them and everything. But um, so I moved to Beijing the second year. I took classes at Beijing University, which is... A, an amazing school in China. Um, I was taking classes with Chinese kids. Like it was, it was amazing. Like market, I like all these creative industry classes. 
Um, it was really cool. I actually took art history for the very first time in Chinese. I was in a lecture hall of, I think, I don't know, like 200, 300 kids. And I was the only <laughs> foreigner. Um, it was so interesting. And yeah. And then I, I just fell in love with Beijing. I mean, Beijing is of all the places. I just love it. It's very gritty. There's lots of culture and it is the place for contemporary art in China which you would think might be Shanghai, but actually it's not. It's Beijing. I love that you literally just blended your two worlds I totally together. did. I'm like, I love art and I love Chinese. How can I bring these two together? And honestly, it was my thesis advisor that helped me because he started giving me research articles about Chinese contemporary art. And it, it's just fascinating because in the 80s, Chinese contemporary art, it was like the renaissance for China that we experienced, you know, way that America experienced after the industrial revolution, they experienced in the eighties because of the, the revolution and the fact that they were cut off from the rest of the world for so long. And as soon as those policies lifted, finally, these artists were able to start processing things that happened and they moved away from making state sanctioned art and propaganda to actually exploring the psyche of of the culture and who they are um you know and and their place in the world so it's really fascinating it was super fascinating so not to jump too far ahead but honestly like this just popped in my head that i really want your perspective on. yeah and obviously not negatively comparing them like what's awful or what's yeah. bad but like i feel like there's got to be differences in american arts cultures and Honestly, arts culture is probably anywhere else, but obviously from your your yeah. personal perspective, Chinese culture. Like, yeah. what do you feel? What did you notice were like the biggest differences in how arts are handled or mm -hmm. promoted or commercialized or whatever that may be? 100%. Yeah. So one of the biggest differences is in the method of, edu of art education in China. So if you go to, say, one of the top art schools in China, and th I mean, things may have changed a little bit since I've been there, but typically the way that um, students are educated in the fine arts in China is copy, copying, copying the masters, like really f being very skilled at what everybody else is doing. And I, and I don't know, I don't know if that's, change but that you can look up pictures of like art schools in China or you know even any sort of um, arts education for younger children you'll see they're all at an easel and they're all painting the same thing and that kind of um, you know that kind of behavior or or experience can be seen in lots of other aspects of Chinese culture but I found that to be really interesting and so one of the coolest things, though, was especially with this art that was coming out of the 80s and 90s was that the art market in China went insane. Like there was this piece called The Last Supper in Chinese. It's a hold the one's hat. The Last Supper. It's, it, I don't want to say it's a parody of The Last Supper because it's just a, a wonderful piece of art. But it's, yeah, I mean, it's like, um, the Last Supper and then all of the, all of the disciples are comrades and they all have, um, they all have, uh, red ties. And then there's, I think it's the Judas character. He has a yellow tie and the yellow tie, and he's like whispering something to one of the other disciples and the yellow tie is supposed to represent capitalism and the red tie communism and that piece sold at the hong kong auction in sotheby's for like i think it was over 30 million dollars wow okay so there was just like this boom i mean because china because of the whole development of china and the people started to have spending power and like there's this art scene now and like people needed to like they they just had opportunities to spend their money so yeah i mean it happened quick it happened really quick so you feel like what's the what's the difference or comparisons even in like the business side of it or even mm -hmm. the career side like is there you know because we were talking yeah. earlier about how 
yes, art has always been there. People have always found a way to make a career out of mm-hmm. entertainment or art. But just in the last couple of years, do I feel like it's been more of a, oh, yeah, you want to be yeah. a YouTuber? Okay, I get it. Yeah. Or, oh, yeah, you want to be a videographer? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, I get it. There are ways to do that. And I, family member B, whatever, ex- or, um, I, I know that that exists. I understand what you're telling me you want to do. What what was that like over there? Like, in comparing the two, do you feel like there was that still that same, like, transition being made? Or was it like, hey, they, like, looked at art in a different way where it was like, cool, yeah. you can immediately jump in and make it a business or make it a career? Yeah, I mean, I honestly... <sighs> I don't know. I didn't really research so much about the individual artist and their journey and experience. Um, I was looking more at arts districts as a whole and the way that they operate in China as opposed to in America. But I do think that it's very, it's similar. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, you have, um, I do, I do think though that the government may provide more resources to artists. It just depends because the government has lots of power and money in China. So, but I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know how grants work in China. I don't, I don't know how any of that works. Um, But that would be fascinating to see. There are lots of very successful artists in China, Mm -hmm. but I, yeah, but I don't really know. Right. Yeah, I don't really know. I don't even know how grants and stuff work here. So I'm, I for sure I, have I no. didn't know until a year ago. I'm learning. It's. <laughs> I Yeah, I, I couldn't even tell you about that sort of stuff from here. So I'm like, hey, yeah, I don't know. Just... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, there's lots of thriving arts districts in China. What's really interesting, though, is that, you know, arts districts, normally they are, they are built from the bottom up. So you have artists that move into an area of low housing cost, and then the culture gets created from that. And then businesses follow the culture, and then the culture leaves, like kind of artist-led gentrification in a way. Yeah. Um, but in China, what's super fascinating is that the government sometimes, because arts districts can be good for the economy, for their image, for social diplomacy, that sometimes you'll see them create arts districts from the top down. So they manufacture art spaces where they build beautiful museums and artist studios and like cafes and whatnot. And a lot of times they're like deserted. Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. But if a if the government wants to say completely bulldoze a thriving arts district, they could do that if they wanted to, okay. or they could uplift and support it right. if they wanted to. It's really interesting. Yeah, I yeah, feel it's like really I'm really interesting. So I'm learning so much just in this. I I mean, because this is stuff I've I've never I haven't had this conversation with anyone before. So I'm yeah, like, wow, it, okay. Yeah, like, it's really weird and. The, a lot of the same principles hold true, though. It's just the artistic spirit and nature of, you know, wanting to work in a shared space that is affordable. And so you look at places like 400 West Rich and other co- co-working artist studio places, and it's like, you know, people pay money because it, it, it feels good to be surrounded by other creatives and, you know, you support each other. Um, so you can see that happen everywhere. Soho, you know, like the short north and you see how culture is created because of artists like being there and arts organizations being there and so the tricky part is how do you keep that balance of like the the uh, market forces not um you know forcing forcing them to move out uh so it's it's a really interesting balance and like i don't even know if i don't know if there's an answer to that honestly and that would be considered under the realm of cultural policy, you know, so how do we protect, protect artists working in a space like that, that is oftentimes commercialized right. where the rent just really increases. So can you explain more of that to me? Because yeah. I, I yeah. feel like I am, I am so, I just, I just don't know that stuff. So yeah. you know, when you're explaining like there can be an arts district or an art community, mm-hmm. but, and I think, you know, in a simple explanation, I understand it, but you know, what, what do you mean when you say like there, there is a balance there of like, can people Mm -hmm. just come in and, and is it a simple thing of like, well, I just mean that 
people make it less about the arts district and more about, well, how has this turned into a big business district now? Well, I mean, oftentimes in America, especially, it's the market that decides the price of real estate. So, you know, if you have, an, say, a gallery that is used to paying a certain amount per month for a space... And then all of a sudden you have these other businesses that are moving in, they're willing to pay a higher price and your landlord's like, well, all these other places are paying a higher price, so you're going to pay a higher price. But, oh, you're an artist or you're a gallery or whatever, you can't afford that. So it's like the market decides at that point Mm -hmm. the price of the, the cost of living. So oftentimes it is just a matter of not being able to afford it anymore. That's one thing, that's one piece that I do think that, and that's where cultural policy comes in. Like, can the government provide, you know, subs- rent subsidies? Like, how do we protect that balance? The other piece of it, though, is more of like a spiritual thing. Like, do artists want to be in a commercialized place? Yeah. So that's where it gets super tricky because it's like, can you have a thriving arts district? Because you, you cannot have a thriving arts district if you don't have other attract like areas to attract people like you can't you know you have to have bars you have to have restaurants you have to have other reasons for people to go to a district so but if it just if it becomes too much in one direction then the artist might leave and or you know you 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 lose that um that that vibe and that energy right so I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's really fascinating. So my thesis in China was I was looking at these two districts, the 798 Arts District, which is very well known, and this other one called Songzhang Artist Village. So 798 is a perfect example of a place that has been very, very commercialized. There's lots of cafes and restaurants. There is a Starbucks Reserve have you ever heard of a Starbucks Reserve? I have not. Um, I think it's only existing in China, but I think maybe possibly in New York City. It's it's a two, three story Starbucks. Okay. Yeah, and they have like a bar. They have like coffee on tap. So there is a Starbucks Reserve at Seven Nine Eight Arts District, but there's also you know there's there are really good arts institutions that are still there. Lots of galleries. But what's different is that the artist studios have decreased immensely since the beginning of 798 Arts District. So there used to be a place where artists created art. So now it has largely become a place of displaying art um, because it's accessible for people. You know, you can go and do lots of things. And, um, and then uh, Songzhang is the complete opposite. There are lots of artists living and working there, but it's not accessible. Like it, there are, there's maybe one or two galleries that you can walk into. The artist studios are like totally closed. When I was trying to do my research there, I had to interview people like on the street and it was about, it took me, Beijing is such a huge city, but it literally took me two and a half hours to get there. And, um, I was trying to do surveys and stuff and like, they were just, they're like, what is this white person? Do? Like what, what is what is going on? It was very interesting, but like, so it was opposite. So like, can you have a place, can you have a district where you have artists working and also displaying at the same time? And you have that vibe that, you know, thriving arts vibe. So that's kind of what I was looking at. So in my, in my thesis through looking at all of that and obviously experiencing it there Mm -hmm. and experiencing it here, do you feel like there's like an argument to be made for for either side making more sense? And I don't mean Chinese mm-hmm. or American. I mean like the market deciding or the people and the passion deciding. Because I feel like mm-hmm. there's so many scenarios and so many conversations I've had with people, not you know about mm-hmm. that specific thing, but about that idea in general of, you know, are you leading into, let's just say it's a project, whatever it is. Are you leading in that project with clarity and communication and authenticity mm-hmm. and, and honesty? Or is it just chasing the numbers? Is it just chasing the, the bar that has been, a, you know, some imaginary bar that's been set of like, well, it has to make this much money or it needs to be this profitable. And then you're effectively pushing out mm-hmm. any of the passion side where the easy thing to say is, is, at least that I would say, is 
yes, it's probably hard to balance. You know, I, I get that. Mm-hmm. I totally understand. Not everybody can just be the, oh my gosh, I just love doing this. And that's of enough course, to, you can't course, pay bills with, with love and passion. Of like course, I yeah, understand. Yeah. But do you feel like there's a balance that isn't being found in a lot of those cases? Mm-hmm. Like where it's just too much of like, mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. market quote unquote is coming mm-hmm. in and bulldozing the passion mm-hmm. because that's just what has to happen. And then it yeah. t- kind of takes the life out for of it. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's who's sitting at the table. Yeah. Who has the money? Who's sitting at the table? So what I think is so fascinating and awesome about Franklinton is that there are people that have the money and that are sitting at the table that are intentionally making sure that the arts and the authenticity of the arts remain as the core of the neighborhood. And that was always the intention with the development there, especially with the 400 West Ridge. Um, whereas the short North, you know, it just didn't, I, I mean, I don't know the full story of every, there are commercial galleries that are doing really well there, honestly. And every city that is growing and developing needs a place like the short North. There's, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the short North is great. Um, but I don't think that there was that same intentionality of making sure that the arts remain the core of this district. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you need people sitting at the table and you need people that have money and you need all of that making those decisions. So, but it's hard. I mean, it's like when the money, you know, right. especially when you have real estate owners and developers that don't, you know, they don't care. So that's always been something that's so confusing to me on, on many levels and in many different avenues mm-hmm. that, I mean, there's huge examples we can give of this, but specifically speaking in like the art world, the creative yeah. world, you know, creative business, all that sort of stuff. I always feel like the person or people who are just honestly, this could be a very like touchy thing to say, I don't know, but I feel like the people who usually end up in charge of something have no no reason to be there at all. There is nothing that says that they should be there outside mm-hmm. of maybe they were the loudest person in the room at the right time yeah. or they have the most money. And yeah. this is probably a whole other, this is a topic for a whole other, whole other podcast yeah. we could do just about this. But like, why do you, why do you think that that is? Why do you feel like that's become such a, a common place when we're, when we're meshing the worlds of creative mm-hmm. and business together? Mm-hmm. And I understand that, yes, nothing can be done without money. Yeah. Why do you think there is such an imbalance, though, of just like you said, sometimes the person in charge, if they have the money, they're the head of the table, they just don't care. And to me, again, this is obviously my personal perspective, so I can't say that everybody should think like this. But for me, I'm just like always in my head. I'm just thinking in the future of like if I'm ever in a position of power anywhere, I'm like... I cannot wait to give back in every mm-hmm. single way possible mm-hmm. and make mm-hmm. this and create that and do all these things. And I know, again, that's just me getting super excited about possibilities. But I just don't understand why a lot of people, one, get into those positions of power off of almost no knowledge of what they're in control of. Mm-hmm. And then they almost don't even have the, con- not almost, most of the time they just don't have the concern of even learning what they're getting their hands into. I mean, it depends on, you know, what you're talking about. Like as far as landlords and real estate and stuff, like at the end of the day, I mean, whoever's in your space is renting from you. So if you know that you can charge higher, like maybe you don't really care what's in the space, but there's honestly lots of examples of, you know, developers in the city that are like very conscious about, investing in the community and giving back and providing a platform and just like being a great example is murals. So this city is, has so many blank walls, not enough money for murals, not enough money. Cincinnati has its own public mural fund. Um, and in a lot of cities, there is a step stipulation that, um, new property new development, a portion of it has to be public facing art. That has been presented to city council, I think city council, um, multiple times and has not passed. But there are lots of develop, like you see all these new buildings that have murals on them because mm-hmm. th- that's what the city wants, you know, we, and I, and of course hiring local muralists is amazing, but also bringing in other muralists from other cities is good too, to kind of increase our, our caliber and, um, 
our, you know, who we are as a city and the country and whatnot. So there, there is a lot of that happening, really. I mean, especially with my work in Wild Goose, like I am aware of, you know, p companies and partners that are, are being very intentional about providing support. And the thing is, there's not a lot of old money in Columbus, whereas Cleveland has a lot of old money. So when an arts organization is looking for support, a lot of times it comes from these new companies that are growing and building and um, they, you know, have the capacity to support. So I would say it just depends. Mm -hmm. It just depends. It depends on the values of the company, the values of the real estate person or whatever it is. So there's hope. There is hope. And you can see that in Franklinton. And that's like, it's just perfect example. I think a lot of people are like, oh, Franklinton is you know, just going to become the new short north or something. And I'm like, well, no, I, I not yet. Right. Not right. yet. It's still going to be its own unique mm -hmm. thing that it's yeah. going to build it in its own way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So Wild Goose, if uh, your viewers don't know, is moving. Well, we are temporarily located at the Bridge Gallery within 400 West Rich, and we will be moved into our new space that is currently being renovated across the street. So we'll be in between Brewdog and the Vanderelli Room. That is awesome. Yeah, we're okay. very excited. It's so going to be really nice. So not to change our, our yeah sorry I just had to put, put no 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 put, we're, put we're good. I kind of want to jump back into you you know you're you're in China yeah 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 and you're learning all these things and you're all this sort of stuff so walk me through the timeline of what was this the decision making process that that you were weighing of like do I stay here and continue to do all this work. Or do I go back to America? <laughs> I will tell you the exact moment. The exact moment, I will tell you. Um, so I was done with my program. I had defended my thesis. All that was done. I did some traveling, went to Europe. Cool. I was looking for, I was like, do I work in Hong Kong? Do I work in Beijing? Do I work in Shanghai? Like, I, it, it's really hard to find a job. Uh, in, in China as a foreigner. And a lot of the jobs that I was seeing or the opportunities that were coming up was not because I was experienced in any one thing. It was because I spoke English and I didn't want to be in a job because I was the person that spoke English. Like I, I really wanted to learn how to do things. So that was, that was one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to come back. But the exact moment was when I was in a hostel, just in this random, random hostel in the middle of the city. And I, all of my friends were gone. They had moved back to wherever they were. And I was sharing a hostel. I was sharing a room with six other girls, no windows. And there, there was this air conditioning unit dripping onto my pillow. And I called my mom after two days of that, I called my mom. I was like, mom, I'm coming home. That was the moment. That was the moment. That's yep. Fair. And I was like, and I haven't been back to China since. <laughs> that, that air conditioning unit really it's did it for you. I know. That was it's it. It's been four years. It's literally. Also, I was sick all the time in China too because of the air, the pollution. I was like, I mean, I have the best, most fondest memories of China. It's, it's such yeah, yeah. a love-hate relationship with China, but like craziest stories ever. Um, but, uh, I, yeah, I was sick all the time. I was sick once a month because of wow. the air, the pollution. It was so bad. Wow. Okay. It's gotten better. It's gotten better since I lived there, though. That is a plus. Yeah. Okay. Like, That's if, some good news. If, if, if it's in the wintertime and there's no pollution for two weeks, it's because the government is having an international meeting and they shut down the factories. Is that real? Yep. That's a... Yep. 100%. You can... Yep. You can literally, like, wow. oh, why is the air clean? Go online and you That's see. That's wild. Yeah. Uh-huh. Man. Okay. Yeah, it was really that intense. That is insane. It was really intense. So, like, so the next thing they need to figure out is no leaky air conditioning units. So we get that solved. Oh, my God. Or just not putting so... them above someone's bed. Yeah. Oh, my God. It was just like, it was too much. I, I And also my fiance, he's doing his PhD at Ohio State. Um, And all my friends were here still. My network was here. I just felt like I really wanted to build my career. 
and I knew that Columbus was the place to do it. Yeah. So it just it was a natural choice for me, and the opportunity at Wild Goose opened up while I w- while I was in China, actually. So yeah. that kind of helped move things along. So what was it? What was it like? This this could be a stupid question, but what was it like keeping in contact with everybody here while being over there? Like, were there ever moments where? Yes, you're you're loving the culture, and and even though mm-hmm. you're sick sometimes, it's still a great place. You're yeah. learning so many amazing things. Were there ever those like moments of like loneliness of like, oh my gosh, I am in oh, a, yeah. a foreign place, and <laughs> I need to talk to the people I love only at these specific times? And oh my gosh, yeah, the worst experience I probably ever had in China, and I love that I get to tell this story on a podcast because it's so funny but it was, ter- it was kind of terrifying, was I accidentally overstayed my visa when I was, it was the summer. So I left for China um, summer of 2016, and I was in another city for two months doing some stuff. And then I was going to fly right to Beijing and start my semester and start my studies. So I was just like hanging out one day and my thesis advisor looks over at my passport and he's like, wait, you don't have 90 days. You have 60 days. And I was just like so dumb that I didn't read my visa that I got because we had the school, the school helped like apply for visas at the time and everybody like got, got 90 days but I didn't look at my own one to make sure that I got night. It was a hundred percent my fault. So I was like, Oh shit. Sh- can I yeah, say okay. whatever you want? I was like, Oh shit. So I got to book, like book myself to Hong Kong so that I could. Okay. So basically like if you need to apply for another visa, you have to go to Hong Kong to do that. Cause Hong Kong's not part. Well, I guess it is now, but it's outside of like the jurisdiction of China. So, um, so I flew, the next day on an expired visa to Hong Kong and my thesis advisor was like, it's going to be fine. Just show them your, your passport at the border. No problem. It's going to be fine. So we flew to Hong Kong, took a bus to the, the port where the border was and we're on the Chinese side and I'm in line and there's nobody there. It's like at 2 a.m. and I go up to the lady and she's looking at my passport. I'm like, it's fine. She's looking at my passport and she's looking up and down. And then she stares at me and she hits this button, this alarm. Okay, that's that's never good. <laughs> that's she a- hits this alarm that goes off no in the way. whole place. And then these these police officers, these Chinese authority people, police officers, come and take me away <laughs> to the back back room. <laughs> So I'm sorry. I'm freaking out. And I'm like just sitting there for a while, not knowing what's going on. And then they were like, you overstayed your visa. And and I am just, I'm, I'm talking to them in Chinese. I'm saying, this is my, I've been in China, you know, three or four times. This is the first time I've done this. I'm so stupid. Like, blah, 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 blah. It's fine. And so they were actually pretty nice about it. And they gave me this blue slip and they said, when you apply for your visa to get back in China and the, at the consulate, you need to give them this blue slip. So I'm like, okay, I'm scot-free. I'm fine. So I am in Hong Kong. The next day I go to the consulate. I fill out the visa application to get back into China and I hand them the blue slip. They take a look at the blue slip and they're like, we can't grant you a visa here because you overstay. You need to go back to New York. Um, and I'm like, mm, okay. So I called, so Basically, I decided to go through the process again, but not say that I overstayed and just, you know, maybe they wouldn't notice. (laughs) Um, But they did again, and they told me that I had to go back to New York. I had no time. I was starting class in like the next day or so, and I um, just, yeah, I just couldn't afford to go back to New York to to do all of this. So then these people were telling me about these shoestring visa agencies that are all across Hong Kong which are not government affiliated, but I don't know what. And so I go to one of the, those places and I ask to get my visa and they were saying like all this stuff of like how I wouldn't be able to get it because so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. So I wait for a few days and I come back and they're like, sorry, your visa was denied email. And I go back there and this was a turning point for me. I, um, 
go back to the desk there and I looked around for a second. I was like, will you try this again if I give you more money? And she was like, yeah. Next day I had my visa. Wow. What should have cost a hundred or 200 us dollars cost me 500 us dollars but i was like this is such a great lesson for me yeah um so yeah wow. so that but i felt extremely lonely then at the, to answer your question like i didn't know what was happening my mom was freaking out like it, it was really i was stuck i was i was there are obviously i'm sure worse travel experiences but it was definitely challenging. I'm like, maybe I'm not going to be able to do my master's in China. Like, maybe I won't even be able to get my visa in New York City. Like, I don't know what this means, like, that I overstayed. Because China is kind of cray-cray <laughs> with that kind of thing. So, but yeah, yeah, there were definitely moments I was just like, oh, my God. I mean, I, I don't know what I would feel even <laughs> here. If I were I here doing something and someone hits a buzzer that sets well, an alarm off it, after looking at me, I'm like, Okay. But it but it really gives you perspective because of all of the heartache and the struggles that immigrants face coming to our country yeah. as Americans having to face something like that is such a rude awakening because people face those problems and worse in this country every single day. Yeah. Yeah. And worse. Yep. Family separate. I mean, it it's just it is so eye opening. You know, we are very spoiled here. Oh yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah. Man, <laughs> so, okay. So that was like kinda cra- kinda crazy story, but Yeah, no, I love it. <laughs> I love that I, is, it's a great story though. So so obviously that's like the height of like, oh my gosh, like what is going on here? <laughs> yeah. Like I just need to talk to somebody I love to tell me that this is gonna be okay. What was no, you, you said you were living in the hostel mm-hmm. in like, like no windows, leaky air conditioning, all that sort of stuff. Was that like the living experience for you the whole time? Was it mm-hmm. just that period? Like what was that ever a part where you were like, oh my gosh, like I'm staying at this place and it's amazing, but it's also like, yeah, oh, man, well, like, but actually pretty much my whole time living in China, I stayed in some pretty nice dorms like in the university, but it was all squatty potties. Do you know what that? squatty potties? I don't is? know what that is. It's a instead of a Western toilet where you sit, it's a it's a hole in the ground. Oh, okay, all yeah, right. So I had to experience that every single day cool. of my life nice. for a year. Actually, I ended up kind of I didn't mind it after a while, but like it's kind of a workout. Right. Yeah. I, <laughs> you're like, you know what? I actually didn't mind it. When I came back home, I ripped my toilet you know off the ground. You know what is amazing, though, about China is there are public restrooms everywhere. The subways in China are immaculate. They are clean. They are beautiful. They run smoothly. They are always on time. And there are bathrooms. There are bathrooms everywhere. When I, I don't even want to go to New York City because I can't find a bathroom. I swear to God, the next time I go there, I'm, I am wearing a diaper. I, I'm serious. Right. Like, because I have to go to the bathroom a lot like yeah the only place you can do that in this in new york is starbucks and there's a line yeah out the door well, I'm also like, feel why like there's probably so many places i feel like here that also it's like you can use the bathroom if you buy something if you buy something the infrastructure in china the logistics they are good they might not be as good as like you know inventing stuff although tiktok though changed the game uh-huh, but uh-huh. like you know, their innovation and whatnot, you can debate, but their logistics, getting people place to place, you know, is good. Like their train system is insane. You can get from Shanghai to Beijing in four hours. If we had their train, if we had their high speed train system, you could get from here to Cleveland in 25 minutes. Yeah. 25 minutes. Do you feel like anything, up. do you feel like that'll ever happen? I feel like I see articles every other year that are like, "There's gonna be this expressway." The government put in. needs like, to invest in the infrastructure, or you know, Elon Musk or some private company needs to do it. But we, we need to fix it. It's just, it's not good. Right. It's really not good. Okay, so, so you know, you live through that crazy story. Yeah. You, you figure out your visa, all that sort of stuff. What eventually leads you to the official decision that I am going to go back to America? Well, it was really when I realized that there was a, a opening to interview at Wild Goose. I'm like, hmm, cool. I had heard about Wild Goose ever since I was in school at OSU. And to be honest, I didn't really know that much about Wild Goose and what it was, but I like knew it was cool. And I wanted to learn how to be an arts manager. Yeah. And I have gotten a crash course in that. And so I'm just super excited because like this is my career path. I love it. I, you know, I'm just, 
it's just great. It's really great. So when you come back, yeah, you get to kind of dive into that position at Wild Goose. Yes. Yeah. So it's like it's it's there when you get back, and then it's just like okay, time for the, like like you said, like the crash course of just like digging. Yeah, in. I mean, it was definitely a slow. Well, yeah, I mean. It, right. It was my first job. It was my first like career career. And actually when I was part time at Wild Goose, I was also part time at um, this company, this Chinese company in Worthington selling paints, pigments. So it was like I was trying to continue the Chinese thing. And but I yeah, it was awful. Um, I did not like it at all. So and then I had the opportunity to become full time at Wild Goose. And then I just um my career has grown since then. And really when I became the executive director, it was when I was just like a, a very big crash course in marketing and fundraising and, you know, budgets and this and that. Um, but I am very thankful that I have an amazing board of directors that is extremely supportive and is made up of lots of am- wonderfully creative people in Columbus that it's just, it's like the relationships, you know, like right. that I'm sure is the same for you and what you do and doing this podcast, like just meeting people is the best part about it. Yes. 100%. Because there are so many cool people in Columbus. Mm-hmm. And what I love about Columbus is that it's big enough that you will have always new people to meet, new things to do, new things to see, but it's small enough that you feel a part of it. Yeah. Right? Well, that's like, that's the insane thing. Even as I've been building, like, you know, I've got this big list in my phone of the yeah. guest list that I want to have on this podcast. And like, yeah, it can, conti- there's just it's like tr- new people All every, time. and I, like, I look at it cause there's times when I'm like going to record like a batch of these episodes and I'm like, okay, well, who do I try and get? And like, it's like, I almost can't think of anyone, right? I'm like, yeah. well, I don't know. I don't personally know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. who's who's in my network that I can get, forgetting that For there's sure. this entire network of people that I have yet to meet, just like yourself, that is like, exactly. oh, well, okay, not only is this podcast a great excuse to meet and chat and get to know each other, but it also easily fulfills the I know, the and I of, could give you like 30 names. And I, yes, and, know, I, and like, I love that. And yeah. that's like, I'll think about it all the time where I'm like, oh man, like, I've talked to so many people like I I don't even know who to get next and then I'll look at that list and it's literally like there's like over 100 people sitting on it that haven't even been on the show yet. Oh, it's so cool. I'm so and, honored to like be here. Oh, I am so. stoked you were down. I am so so, so How do you about feel about the creative scene? Like how would you describe it? So, it's funny because the more that I like have been getting into it over the years, I still feel like I'm just on the outside of the actual creative community. Hmm. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way. Yeah. I just mean that like, I, I don't feel like I fully like engulfed myself in it. Sure. Now, part of that has honestly been over the years. Like I'm, and I know this is like an excuse that everybody uses now, but like, I am like definitely an introverted person to where when there You're are extremely extroverted introvert. Yes. Yes. That is, that is far more accurate. Um, because like the, the notion of getting myself to go somewhere, like an event <laughs> somewhere or something yeah, like that, I'm like, I, I don't know. There's not a point in me being there. I don't know what I'm going to do when I'm there. I just like, I don't know. There's just no way <laughs> yeah. I could do that. But then when I'm there at the things, obviously they're great but then i'm like oh my gosh i met this person and i chatted with this person and that person and blah 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 yeah for sure i mean it's like it's still nerve-wracking for me going to even an art event and i'm like i don't maybe i'm going by myself like i don't know who i'm gonna see but but yeah and that's part of the whole thing with wild goose is that we want to make that experience accessible for people and like that they feel welcome to come into an arts environment and institution because there are so many barriers to entry that are very natural and that we still have at wild goose we are an art space and there Mm -hmm. are natural just kind of like oh i don't belong there like that's not for me i mean i i walk down the street and i pass a gallery and even i still feel a little uncomfortable like walking in there um so trying to make that experience better for people and like more comfortable but obviously there is still so much work for us to do on that right well and I I feel like even for me personally it's like the difficult thing is I'm always worried about like overstepping boundaries isn't the right way to phrase it but Mm -hmm. I, I always just I really do feel out of place in so many places that I go where I'm like 
I know if I just got to sit down with like this person, we'd have a great conversation. But I'm always like, man, if I approach them and want to talk to them, they're going to think I'm trying to sell them on something or I want to work. Like 100% if I didn't have this podcast, I don't know if you and I would ever meet. Like even if I was That's at an so event funny. or something, I'm, I'd That's be like, so even if I, I knew about you and anything else, yeah. I'd be like, oh, well, I, yeah, I don't know. She's probably got way more important people to talk to than me. Like well, I can't this do is like, why this is a great platform for you to like, you know, get involved and like meet so many people. Like that's awesome. I mean, just for me looking at your Instagram profile for this, I, there's all these awesome people that I had no idea about. Right. So right. it's just, yeah, it's awesome. This has definitely become my like secret, like key into getting yeah, to know a hundred percent because, it's so cool. and it's also like, I jokingly say that, but it also literally is such a more comfortable environment mm-hmm. because, you know, like I was saying, like, I'm afraid to approach somebody at an event, you know, in, in a For world sure. where those exist. Um, I'm afraid to approach people at an event because I don't want them to feel like I'm trying to sell them on something or trying to pass out a business card. Or I also like, you know, the whole like love languages thing, like your five, you know, my top one is quality time. Mm-hmm. So that is with any, anyone. So I also like overly value, like, I would rather go up to somebody in an event and be like, hey, I'm so-and-so, nice to meet you. I, you know, big fan of whatever you do or whatever it is. Can we get coffee sometime Mm -hmm. or can we sit down or can we Zoom or whatever it is and really get to know each other? Because even though I could have a really good conversation with people at that event, happens all the time, 100%. There's no part of me that's going to pretend like that doesn't happen. But I so much value so much more a genuine just one-on-one conversation where I don't feel like I'm begging for their time or, or, or I'm not having to worry about in my head like I guarantee like they keep looking to the left I bet there's somebody over there that they really want to talk to instead like, yeah no I mean I have to say I definitely don't miss all of the networking I do miss the networking events mm-hmm. but I also don't miss the networking events because the whole like jumping into a conversation, ending the conversation, like that whole thing. That's why for networking events, I love the speed dating style because it takes that awkwardness out of it. You are just like boom, 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 meeting people. And then you figure out which one you want to, or which people that you feel you want to connect with afterwards. There's an intention and a purpose of, we know we're coming here to sit down and get to know each other. Well, and I also think with the quarantine though, we have been forced to pay more attention and feed our current relationships with people as opposed to just like throw up meeting people this and that way that you're like, maybe you're not going to do any, you know? So that's been cool. Like that's been, that's been really cool. And I, and I think it's allowing us to go internally and focus more on, you know, who makes the most sense to be collaborating with Yeah, and, um, just nurturing those relationships. I think. Do you feel like that'll continue to like change when things, let's just say get back to normal or whatever. Like, do you feel like people are going to be more intentional with like how they meet somebody or who they're, or what the conversations are? Or I don't know. I don't know. I, I talk to people that are like, we're changed forever. Nothing is going to be the same for our generation. Like we were events aren't going to be the same. Nothing's going to be the same. In my mind, I'm thinking when everybody's vaccinated, we're all going to be on the street looking the sidewalk. There's going to be a right. renaissance. There's going to be events there. We're going to go crazy. We're going to go crazy. Like, so uh, maybe that's the part of me that wants to believe that. But I also kind of do believe that. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Spanish flu spurred the renaissance, a renaissance, a renaissance. So I'm hoping that's going to happen for us. Like I'm, I'm hoping we can get back to the way we were because there is kind of a sweetness though about, uh, just moving inwards a little bit though. I I mean, I 100% think so. Like there's a lot of conversations I've had with people about, you know, the past year where I, I feel like it was, you know, Clearly, a terrible reason why. But the forced slowdown for a lot of people, I think, was something that a lot of people needed to happen. Yeah. Yeah, like, we were running on fumes. Yeah, where it's just like you, you, yeah. you're doing, even though it's like, I'm not saying everything was bad yeah. at all, but it's very easy to get caught up in your day-to-day cycle of I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing this and I'm not slowing down and then blah, blah, blah. Even if you feel like you're slowing down, you're not really. For sure. So then when all of that is forcefully taken away of like, 
yo, we need you guys to just chill for a little yeah. bit. Don't do anything. Yeah. I feel like I've talked to a lot of people who have said that like once that forced stop, the halting of everything that they would normally do happened, they were able to look at themselves or their immediate surroundings or their immediate relationships or job or whatever and be like, oh, wait, when I don't have this just going through my daily cycle at 100 miles an hour, I'm actually identifying a lot of things mm-hmm. that I'd like to change. 100%. I have grown so much in the past year, as I'm sure so many people have. But I have I'm always the type, like, I mean, I I would consider myself more of an extrovert, but I'm always on the way to something else, like on the way to the next thing. And I have been able to just appreciate, like, Sunday night bath because Mm -hmm. that's my time. And it's, no, maybe it's not a 90-minute hot yoga class, but I'm treating it as such, and I'm taking these little things that I would have just taken for granted and it's become a ritual for me and um, it's been really wonderful and I've taken up meditation practice. So yeah, there's lot, there's lots to be grateful for. Um, but you know, there's part of me that definitely misses like going to do dance parties and all that stuff, you know, going to bars. Maybe when this is over, we'll be able to, like, find a better balance, like you said. Right, right. Maybe we will. So digging into that, honestly, like, what what do you see, uh, obviously specifically in, you know, the events and the arts community and all that sort yeah. of stuff, what do you feel like or what do you have already planned or in your mind is almost like a a way to get back to those things? Like, how do you see that taking shape? Well, it really depends on people's comfort level. So at this point, we are offering hybrid and in-person events, but very, very low attendance, as well as just online events. So until, you know, we start to see a shift of people feeling comfortable to come to things, like we're not going to offer something that is going to make people unsafe. So it really depends on the vaccine and how people are feeling. I don't know. I mean, I I don't know what things are going to look like, to be honest. Um, But it has forced us to innovate and it's been a challenge, you know, trying to make sure that we have enough resources to support our organization as well as, as having to innovate at the very same time of like doing these things that we have never done before, like online programs. And we've found a lot of success in some of the things like our fundraisers, for example, have actually made more than in previous years because we didn't have overhead costs associated with it, which is really cool. Yeah. Albeit stressful, but, um, but really cool. So yeah, I, I think that we're going to see a hybrid for a while Mm -hmm. and it, it may be for the next year or so until people feel more comfortable to come out. Right. Um, so it's just kind of like reading the crowd, seeing mm-hmm. what other people are doing, seeing what other arts organizations are doing, and just making sure that we're safe, but still offering, you know, programming that is enjoyed by the community and, um, you know, making sure that we can still be a platform for artists and things like that. So I'm going to switch subjects a yeah. little bit here, but I really, really want your perspective on this. So... We even we mentioned like TikTok earlier, right? And we're talking about all you know the the different cultures of people being creative, and whether it's mm-hmm. physically having a place, you know, in a building where mm-hmm. it's like this is my art studio, or it's just sharing stuff on social. Do you feel? And I feel like this is becoming such a cliche question for anyone to talk about. What do you feel like the balance is between people genuinely creating art and finding a way to do it? or getting really caught up in what social media has kind of in Mm. some ways turned art into. Hmm. Obviously there's one part where it's like social media didn't exist. There's a lot of people who wouldn't know about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. One million percent. Yes, yes, yes. Can't argue that. Yep. But at the same time, there's also the argument of like, it honestly maybe deters people from making art sometimes Hmm. because they're not getting the interactions. They're not getting the likes. They're not in. And even though it's very easy to be like, well, Hey, just don't worry about those things. 
so many creative people like you want your stuff to be cared about yeah in some way whether it's a like number on a photo or it's somebody telling you in person i love this thing you did what do you i i really want your perspective on this of like what do you i guess the simplest way for me to put it is what do you feel like social media has done and it could be multiple examples to the creative culture to the creative world well i think that social media has made and it's not just social media but kind of contemporary culture and globalization which i guess is in result of communication with each other via social media and tv and things like that but you can see the arts being very globalized and becoming very disparate so i mean in the past you used to have art schools and like you know very specific types of art that was being created at the same time in response to the same thing honestly like american abstract expressionism is its own category with like and and a lot of people in that school like knew each other and and so art kind of was more in that form i am not an art historian by the way so i may be saying like completely talking out of my ass but um and now there's just there's so much it's like music it's like spotify you know you you are there there are so many things happening there's a platform for everything so it's like you're your experience as a consumer is curated by like what you're interested in. So in terms of like the individual artist experience with Instagram, I, you know, I am not an artist um, and I have not used Instagram as an artist. I have as as an organization, but I kind of look at it like you are running a business. I mean, if you want your art to be your life or your career, then there are some things that you kind of got to play by to run a business. And one of those things is social media. So it just, it depends on what your goals are. It's like, if you want to be, you know, some just doing it for your own personal pleasure and you don't really care that anybody sees it, then maybe you don't need social media. But if you want this to be your life, then you, you know, you have to consider having it be part of your marketing plan and donating specific amount of time to that and caring for that. It's like, you can't do everything you love all the time. You can't just stay in your studio a hundred percent of the time because nobody's going to see it. Are you even creating art if nobody's seeing it? So it's like, you know, there's some, some, some things you just kind of got to do. Um, and yeah, yeah. So, but it's, it's interesting. I also do think that like the role of the curator has become more important over the years because there is so much stuff going on that like a curator kind of determines what is important or the curator creates the story. And yeah, so I, I think that's kind of interesting too. Um, and you know, you see that a lot, like in museums and, and galleries, like these wonderfully themed shows. Um, so the way that art is presented and is consumed has, has changed. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking visual art, but also, yeah, also music and, and everything. Right. Um, and I don't know that one way is, is better than the other, to be honest with you, but that would be interesting to look into like the amount of people that are pursuing a creative career now, as opposed to maybe the fifties or sixties. Oh, I, I'm yeah, really yeah. interested. Do you know, like if there has been an increase? I'm, I'm for sure not educated enough to give actual explanation yeah, of that. Like, I don't know. I, I, all I have is like my personal perspective of like, you know, we, we talked even a little bit before the show of like, you know, one of the things that I've done over the years was like social media marketing. Right. And not necessarily like creating the ads and doing all that sort of stuff, but just how does your visual content play out on a social calendar? Right. You know, how does it promote everything? Blah, right. blah, blah. And like, for me, like, I I feel like over the last couple of years, I have just become so burnt out on social media mm-hmm. to where now, it, it, and this is so like, I, I don't know, such a complaint thing to say that I see so many people say now, but, and I say it too, it's like, there's a part of me that doesn't know if I'd be on social media if it didn't feed into my business. You know, mm-hmm. like I really do think that I'm like, yeah, yes, I love scrolling through and seeing things mm-hmm. and whatever. But like, I don't, I don't know if I'd be sharing. I don't know if I'd be 
that worried about it if I didn't kind of need to be worried about it in a way. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the other part that has made me so burnt out is, and again, this is another one of those conversations that is just a whole podcast episode on its own. But I also think there's, I almost, I almost think there's a problem with attention spans that, that social media is for sure feeding into And I don't just mean feeding into of like, oh, yeah, people just aren't paying attention. But the problem is, is like the algorithms Mm -hmm. and all those sort of buzzwords are feeding into short and quick attention spans where uh, there's people who I know personally who like my work, who if I see them six months from now, they'll have no idea that you were on this podcast Mm -hmm. because they didn't see anything about it, even though we're friends and they might see some of my stuff. For sure. So, and again, that's not a thing that's like you or I could sit and fix and and even have the the right answers for. But that's kind of where my head always goes is like, it's both way easier to create and share and also getting progressively way harder. I know. It's just the, you know, we're in the information age right now. I just, I honestly wonder if the next age is going to be like the distillation age of just like there's so much crap like there's so much stuff right and just distilling that into like we're all over the place with everything I agree I mean I social media is a job I mean it is straight up just like sometimes not enjoyable at all I mean and you know Facebook is ugh it's just, yeah, the algorithms and stuff, you know, and like you think that you're going to post something, it's going to do really well, and then it doesn't. Or you post something that you don't think is going to do well, and then it does great. It's just like, oh. Well, it's like, I, so I, know, frustrating. I know friends who create things or stop themselves from creating things based off of how they know it's going to do on social media. Ugh. That's because, interesting. Be, yeah. Because it's huh. almost like it deters them because they're like, well, I see this person making these things and they have thousands of likes and I tried that of and course. it got 50. Of course. Which must mean, and this is just, again, people's reactions to things and getting your emotions in check and all that sort of stuff. But when you're getting kind of an immediate example like that, that makes you think what I did is not good. Yeah. You and know? you know what? And I'm like, I... I feel for artists and people and individual creators on these platforms because like, how can you not look to the left and right of, of you and see what other people are doing and their, and, and their engagement? Like it's a lot and it's just so easy. It's so easy to compare yourself because the numbers are right there. And so you take that as like, oh, well, they're better than me or like they, they're doing something that I'm not doing. So yeah, I mean, if you put it like that and if it is actually hindering your creative process you know maybe that is a a thing i it's definitely it's definitely an influence on creativity whether it be good or bad like but it is absolutely absolutely an influence sorry i i I was a debbie downer there i just i just took us down and just like oh man everything's super hard it's really interesting it's like there's art movements that are responding the the content of the art is in response to the information age and the internet and everything and then you have like the actual internet influencing it it's just yeah yeah it's just this weird mix of like are are the people who are or are not interacting with this stuff truly making that choice yeah or is it the curated feed the algorithm the almighty algorithm is that making the choice you know is is it like yeah true 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 i mean it's interesting it's you can also talk about the role of the art critic especially in the past where a lot of times the art critic was the one making decisions on what was good art and what was bad art if an art critic said oh jackson pollock is the head of the you know american art scene and like created the basically the dawn of the American art scene than he did than he is so it's kind of like and then you know critics obviously influence what art what what artists make so it's always kind of like yeah I just I I am very and that's why I'm so interested in this career in this field because I am not a visual artist at all and I find the whole process fascinating because I don't really know, you know, like where, how are they making their decisions? Is it because people like certain things? 
I mean, you have to know, it's like you, you have to know what people like though, at, at, to an extent, like you need to know your audience, you need to know your target market, who buys your pieces, how do you, but how do you maintain your, you know, creative individuality in addition to making sure that you're making a living? When it's like it even, it, I, for me, I feel like it ties back into even what the conversation earlier of like physical cultures yeah it's like the market decides like there's yeah yeah yeah. something that i don't know if you're familiar with the uh gary v or not like the so he he's this he's a he's a cool guy i'm gonna make this sound super negative but he's he's a very (laughs) famous uh media personality like he creates a bunch of businesses he lives in the entrepreneurial world and he's kind of turned into this like social media motivational speaker guy Mm -hmm. who's he's that person who's like just get up and do it come on blah 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 the issue is like there, there's something that he he says a lot where he's like, well, the market decides and blah blah blah, and it's in talking about social media, and I, I'm just like, I, and I'm sure he's explained this so many different ways. So I'm just taking mm-hmm. one part of something that I saw, but like, to me, I feel like even so much of what he tells people to do is just like let someone else decide what you should do, and if you want a good result out of it. Mm-hmm you need to like do what social media is saying is cool right now. But three videos later, he'll be like, if you're not authentic, you're creating for the wrong reasons. And I, again, I just feel like there's something there that feeds almost directly into, like we were talking about earlier, where even physical arts districts, the market kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. decides of like, okay, is there enough money coming in here? Mm -hmm. Do we need to bulldoze this place? Can we feed into it? Mm -hmm. Can we rebuild? Can we build something Mm -hmm. awesome on top of it? Yeah. Where I feel like social media is almost taking on, it's taking on such a similar form. It's like, it's not a physical place, but it's doing the same thing where it's like, if you're not following the current trend as a creator, or even as a brand in the way that you'll market or brand yourself or promote yourself, it's like, are we, are we following the certain, the, the current trends? Are we sharing as much as we should be? Or are we you know, is there a chance that just because we post, um, you know, once every two weeks, are we missing out because we're not posting three times a week? Yeah, for real. You know, are like, we not posting at the right time? Yeah. Like, what is it? It's, what, is it is it because my, is my post didn't do well because I didn't post it at, at 3 p.m. or, you know, oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, it, I, I still, I still am Googling that. I'm like, what's the best time to post? Right, and, right. It, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a lot. It's Social media is a lot, and I'm very curious to see how it unfolds. But it's true. It's like you, everyone, all these great creators, you know, are saying you you got to be authentic. But how, how can you be authentic when you are just constantly being fed with so many different things all the time well to me it goes back to like i can also compare it to like networking events in a way where it's Mm -hmm. like okay i'll use myself as an example i could meet and chat with the person i really want to chat with at this networking event and we could have an amazing conversation that leads to something great even if it's just an awesome friendship But if I don't do that because there's a sea of 50 other people who are louder than me, who are talking to that person and making sure they meet, that person effectively has no idea that I exist. Mm. So it's like like kind of the same way of social media. And again, the answer to this, this somebody like Gary Vee could sit here and it's like, well, then you need to take the opportunity and do it. And I get it. (laughs) But, you know, it's like when you're having that battle of, I want to have an authentic conversation and connection with that person where I'm not saying those 50 other people don't, but I saw 50 of them run up and give an elevator pitch and toss a business card and beg them for work. Okay. There might be a difference where I feel like that almost mirrors in social media where it's like, okay, since I'm not posting 97 times a day and I'm not turning my videos into TikTok form and making them easier to ingest. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's <laughs> oh, like... Oh, you can't keep up. You know, it's, it's, and it's going to be an ever-evolving thing. Yeah. But I feel like that just sort of feeds into the same thing where it's like, okay, if you're being authentic but you're being quieter than the other people, does it, right. does it matter? Because the person who you're being authentic for that you hope it attracts there's a good chance they're not going to see it. And it's not because they wanted to avoid it. It's because they didn't know it was there. <sighs> yeah. 
and like I said, this is a whole other just whole know, other it's conversation. So we we actually yeah, we had a program at Wild Goose called Human School, and it was a philosophical program where um, Michael Hiltbrunner, who is a philosophy professor at Columbus State, I believe, led these dis- discussions just like on philosophy, and it was really cool because it was it was just awesome to get in a room with strangers and talk about philosophy. Yeah, and this is a wonderful example um, because we don't get to do that so much. Right. Because we're on our phones, on social media. I deleted TikTok because I was spending way too much time on it. And I was like kind of getting into like the dark side of TikTok in a weird way. What's like, the dark side of TikTok? Like, th- like my fears, like things that... So <laughs> I am kind of afraid of flying and... Uh, I was all of a sudden I was starting to see these like TikTok videos of people on planes like freaking out or like things going wrong with planes, even if it was just edited or something. And obviously I'm going to watch it because it's my fear. And they just kept coming up. I'm like, this is not okay. This is not healthy. And it was just weird. Like I was getting into some weird kind of things and (laughs) I was spending like two hours on TikTok and it's, uh, yeah, it's addicting. Like I can't stop. So I deleted it. Well, good. And I also don't have a Twitter. Nice. My fiance has a Twitter. He, he's all about the academic Twitter life, which is like, I, I look at Twitter and I, I'm like, what am I reading? How do I read this thread? What is going on? Right too much do you have a twitter i do have a twitter are you successful on twitter well funny story about that so i made a twitter like when it first popped up forever ago in like 2000 i don't know eight or nine or something like that i was like oh this is cool i'm gonna make it so i had one since then and over the years i think i built up a following to like eight thousand people or something like that oh dang however here's where the story takes a turn (laughs) and this is feeding straight into everything we're talking about with social media I last summer deleted it. Okay. Because, again, like I said, for such a long time, I was a social media guy. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. this and that and this and that. And yeah, I mean, you have whatever. a really big following. So. so, and the same thing was happening with my yeah. Instagram, right? I almost deleted my Instagram too, but I was like, I've posted way too much work on here. I can't do that. Yeah. Anyway, for Twitter, built up this following to like 8,000 people, whatever it is. However, none of them were actually there. None of them were actually yeah. interacting. Right, so right, 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 right. It was just this empty thing that like I literally just last summer I got fed up with it. I was like, this means nothing. Like, yes, at face value. <laughs> yeah, so true. At face value, someone can go and be like, Whoa, you have eight thousand followers right, on Twitter. That's but so they're sick. They're not gonna like your post. Yeah, and then I'm like, okay, go look at my last ten tweets and watch my two friends interact with <laughs> yeah, these exactly. tweets. Exactly. And it's so exactly. it's like that's how I feel about Wild Goose Twitter. Like we we have lots of followers. Um, and I'm like, I but I don't know what to post. I mean, you're supposed to post like hot takes or something, and I'm just like, I can't. Instagram is where we shine. I mean, mm. I think you should know which platform is best suited for you but it's just there's this this expectation that you need to do all of it there was a um podcast of this art this arts leader podcast uh, talking about how to incorporate tiktok into your arts organization and i'm like i can't you know it's hard enough to manage instagram and facebook like let alone tiktok i mean it is i posted one video on tiktok of me counting to 10 in chinese how oh how fast can I count the ten in Chinese? And I was really proud of it, but I'm like, I just feel so nervous posting something on there because you you know you want it to be like, I'm actually really impressed with the the gumption that people have to just like post stuff. Mm-hmm. It's impressive. I don't feel comfortable doing that. For me, I almost feel like it's less of a comfort thing and more of just an energy thing. Oh really? Because yeah, fe- feeding straight into what you just said though of like oh my gosh. People are saying that brands should have TikToks now. I I have never made a TikTok. And there's there's so many people that are like, dude, you should cut little videos down and put them on TikTok. It'd be so cool. And I'm like... That would take you so long. It's it's it, just like you just said. That it's would, such an... It's an extra thing. It would take you like two hours a day to and do And again, that. there's big, you know, influencers, you know, social media coach people who are like, you need to be on every platform or you're not trying hard enough. And it's like, dude... That does not feel authentic to me. Yeah. 
No. Like, yeah, it's too much. It's too much. I really feel like there should be more messaging around finding the platform that works for you and sticking yes. to that. I I have had that conversation with so many like brands and, and clients before. Yeah. Where they're like, well, you know, we have our Twitter, but we don't really know what to do with it, but we have it. And I'm like... That's fascinating. Do you think there's a need for you to have Twitter or did you just like... Did you just make it because you knew it was yeah, a social media? That makes because me feel better. <laughs> I, I feel I really feel like if you don't see a true purpose in it or you're not getting a real reaction yeah. or anything, yes, if Instagram makes the most sense, then great. Insta- yeah. That is what makes the most sense. Like I, I literally just two weeks ago talked like a, a new uh client who like runs their own brand. Um, I literally talked them into getting rid of their Twitter. Yeah. Because they were like, yeah, we have it. We're not really sure even what to post on there. Um, and they're just reposting probably stuff that they're posting on Facebook, like events. And it, it, it's just, that's what we were doing. And I'm like, we are not getting any engagement on this at all. And and again, there's a lot of like examples of like how to use Twitter. Like, you know, the, the classic thing is like, you know, you have places like Wendy's and stuff on Twitter who yeah. have become like the troll accounts where they'll just like openly joke about stuff and make it super funny. But in a weird way, they've made that a part of their brand. So therefore, people are now interested in Wendy's Twitter. Right. Even if they're not interested in Wendy's. Right. In, like, right. Sure. I've eaten Wendy's. I think it's cool. Whatever. I'm not going to follow them on Twitter because of that. But I'll check out their Twitter if they just roasted somebody. Exactly. You know, exactly. because then it's more interesting. It's more funny. So it's like, yeah. again, even the huge companies mm-hmm. are finding out how it makes the most sense for them and how they're making it work for them. And because right now, I think comedy and, and whatever sells in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. So cool. It's an easy thing they can tap into and they can roast somebody who asks about their chicken nuggets and everyone's like, oh my God, this is great. I love Wendy's Twitter. Yeah, no, it's, that actually makes me feel better because I'm always like, oh, yeah, I mean, we should be posting more on Twitter or like, it's just, I feel like, oh, I'm not doing enough. I should be posting everywhere all the time. And, and then it, it be just a waste of time because yeah. even though we have lots of followers on Twitter, it's like, we don't get the engagement. So what's the point? Ex- and also, exactly. I don't understand Twitter. I just don't. I'm like. Right. So whenever it's funny, like whenever we've we've got interns that are super passionate about Twitter, they go and make our Twitter awesome, and like we get like increased engagement, and then they leave, and then I just don't even right, right. bother with it because I just can't. It's it's too much. I it's mean, too much. Again, just like you said, you're like cool. We have a cool following on there, but what is that engagement or, or interaction? Yeah, what is it really doing? It's the same reason right, I was right, like. Right. I'm just going to delete my Twitter and start a brand new one and I'll have a couple hundred followers maybe and I just don't care. Or like the Facebook stories thing. Do people, do people post their Instagrams? Can you do that? Can you post your Instagram stories to Facebook? You double it up, yep. Okay. Because it used to not be that way. You used to have to do two different... Yeah, and then, I mean, pretty much since... Who watches Facebook stories is my question. Do you? I don't. I personally like don't. Does? I I get notifications from Facebook telling me that people watch mine. Really? Oh, do you do Facebook stories? I could, because literally my my Facebook is connected to my Instagram. Oh, okay. So whenever I put, I'll just post a story oh, to okay. Instagram, oh, okay. and it copies Goes itself there, yeah. over automatically onto onto Facebook. Oh, okay. So otherwise, I wouldn't post it. That's another thing. Twitter just added their own stories. Oh, <gasps> I know something else to worry about. Okay. Okay, can we just, okay, this is perfect. This is just like a perfect, um, yes. Okay, so everything we were talking about. What I love about China is talking about logistics and everything. WeChat. WeChat is Facebook, Twitter, um, you, your wallet. You, you pay for everything via your WeChat Literally everything you could possibly want, every app you could possibly want is in WeChat. That's wild. Because the government, you know, they cut out market competition. So lots of these big companies in China are partially owned by the government. So the government controls. So it's not like in America where you have Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, like all these different companies competing and you have to be spreading your attention around to all these different things. Like I I would love one app. One app. Honestly, maybe that's the future. 
That would be Except that's, awesome. Except that's what people say. Like, you know, people have these ideas and then another company has that same idea and then exactly. they create their thing and then it gets up. Oh. Yep. There, there was, do you remember that app? Uh, I don't remember what it's called because clearly it didn't work. <laughs> but I think it was like two or three years ago that popped up for a couple weeks that people were like, this is the new Instagram. It just doesn't have an algorithm. Oh, so it's Finster? Like, or, was that it? Wait. What was know, it called? Like, fin, fin, something like for that. Like friends or something? That sounds familiar. But anyway, it's like that thing popped up and it was like, hey, there's no algorithm, no curated feed. When people post, that's when you're going to see it, just like the good old days. But it never caught on and not enough people went to it because now there's like a yeah. monopoly of apps and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, and again, so that's like the, the stupid thing. It's like, okay, did you post to your story on Instagram today? Did you post to your story on Facebook today? Did you post to your story on Twitter also? And did you make TikTok versions of those like, videos? Seriously, like, seriously, people in the future are going to look back on this and they're going to be like, that was so unnecessary. I hope. Just like how I feel about, <laughs> about like chords. Like yes. chords. I think chord, like when we think about what is archaic, I think that chords are very archaic. Like people are going to look back and be like, y- what? Chords? I'm totally, yes. Do you feel the same way? Yes. I'm like, I why do we way? have chords? You know, one <laughs> really specific thing that I feel that way about is the way you hook up your internet. Okay. Yeah. I feel yeah, like having a weird. modem and it's cables. It's so archaic. It should be just like built into the wall. Like I, I should honestly be able to charge my phone on the table. Literally, it should just, be it should no be chords. Yes. <laughs> I, yes. We need to simplify. We need to simplify life. I totally agree. Yeah. And I, I, I think about those same things. I'm like, I should not have to like hook this thing up. And it's not that it's difficult. It's just that it's like <laughs> strangely old. Yeah. Yeah, like, it is. I mean, you, you, yeah. It's like you look at wires and just all that stuff just feels archaic. And me. obviously like, you know, Bluetooth is becoming more of a thing. And yeah, all Bluetooth, that. So, but I'm like, Bluetooth's great. but when does it like kind of like you're, when does that really completely take over where it's like <laughs> right. okay cool yeah these headphones just connect to and i guess the answer is like we'll use your airpods idiot like i guess there's <laughs> yeah. a there's an option i suppose yeah. that maybe we're not thinking about but i do totally agree yeah, and, and i wonder if that will happen with with apps because mm-hmm. but as quickly as we brought that idea up we were easily shooting it down because they're like, well, if one person finds success, in America. then there's going to be another app that wants that exactly, same success. Exactly. And then you're going to have to go to that one and you're going to have to go to... In- well, in China, you do not need your wallet for anything. You hold up your WeChat and has your bank is connected to a QR code. That's awesome. They scan it. You could go anywhere. You could buy, you know, you could buy a scorpion on the side of the road in China and you can to eat and you can do that. And that, when I came back to America, I was like, Oh my gosh, you guys. I need, need these cards and this cards, wallet. Cards, wallet. This. Like, what is this? Right. I carry but Apple too Pay. Many I'm sorry. Do you have Apple? I don't have, an, I don't have an iPhone. Like, I have an iPhone, but I don't use the Apple Pay. And just, I don't know what. Maybe I'm missing out. I don't know. I don't know. But I don't, I don't use Apple Pay. It's, it, seriously, in China, it is absolutely mainly just boom, phone, paid. Well, see, the confusing thing to me about Apple Pay, and again, I haven't looked into it. So I could, I'm just talking out of my ass here. But I feel like it's the same thing, like banking apps and quick pay apps are the same thing as all other apps, where it's like, you can do it, but your ba- this bank doesn't work with this app. So it's if you this, want that, yes, exactly. then you have what, to have like... Yeah, Cash I can, App, like, Venmo, yes, Zelle. Like, yes. like, oh my God, all these banks have their different things. It's seriously like... <sighs> I think one of the most recent forms of that is streaming services. So look at what happened with that television yep. started to become this thing where it's like oh my god you want me to pay oh, for 50 service. channels i've got uh-huh. netflix and hulu and i can do whatever i want now every tv channel is making their own exclusive streaming service and that's the only way you can watch you certain know what? shows maybe in my heart i am truly a communist and i'm just like we need to live in a state where the government just decides what right. bank we all have right. decides what social media app we all use and guess what it's all in one app i'd be down with that like whatever like, it would let's simplify just my life simplify it <laughs> yeah. it's just, it's a never ending cycle again yeah. one good thing comes along then everyone else is like oh we have to have our version but of that but you good couldn't thing. be the next billionaire and create the next instagram though in that situation right <laughs> so, so then, the american dream would be crushed <laughs> oh, oh the american dream oh goodness okay so i want to i want to bring us back around sure. before we start to wrap up yeah what last couple questions sure 
what sort of impact on the arts community, whether here in Columbus or maybe even at large, do you hope to leave? Like, what sort of impact do you want to see happen? And that could be with Wild Goose, or that could be literally just you, hmm. Lydia. Like, what do you hope, like, what is your impact that you want to leave behind? That's a really good question. Um, I am all about arts accessibility and breaking down those barriers and really essentially the mission of Wild Goose, building community and supporting conversation through art. And I have worked, I mean, I, I worked at, I had an internship at the one of the top contemporary art museums in Beijing, which was a great experience. You know, I've worked in higher arts institutions, and it's all fine and good, but there there is um, an air to those places that is inherently not accessible. And so the minute that I walked into a place like Wild Goose, I was like, oh, this is interesting, this is cool, like, this is... I vibe with the values of this place. And um, I just think that I, I'm really, in terms of the legacy of Wild Goose, um, you know, I'm just really, really excited to build the community in Franklinton more. And I mean, there's already organizations that are doing such great work in the arts and in the neighborhood there, but providing more support and figuring out ways that we can better connect the residents of Franklinton to the arts district and provide more dialogue with the artists working there. And so, I mean, there are so many youth that are interested in arts that are living just across the highway, but they don't, you know, there's no, there's not a lot of good accessible entry points. Um, so that's one thing, building community. The other is also just like, uh, one of the things is we were all about, you know, we say we want to support our art. If we're talking about visual art, for example, like we want to support our artists here in Columbus because they're making, you know, there's so many artists making lots of art here. But how are we supporting our artists if we're not supporting the culture, culture around collecting art? So that's something that's changed. Um, just the people going into galleries and buying things. Like there are, there's lots of people that, have money, especially young professionals in the city that just don't know where to start. They don't know how to get into that. And honestly, you don't even need to have money to collect art. I didn't realize that. I mean, it took me a, probably a year and a half of working at Wild Goose to finally make my first purchase. And it was a $50 piece. And ever since then, I've been hooked and I purchase art that makes me feel happy. And that's what collecting is. And so I love that we are able to offer events like Wild Art Columbus where all of the pieces are $100. And so it's a perfect accessible price point for people to get into an artist and start collecting from them and learning about it and like just filling their homes with the art that's being made here. So in terms of like changing the culture, I would love to help change the culture around collecting art. And I think that Wild Goose is in a great position um, and has a great platform to start doing that. So, yeah. So for Wild Goose, that's what I'm excited about. Um, and then for me, you know, just building my career continually and figuring out what I love and, you know, what I don't love so much. And um, I've come to really love fundraising. It's hard. It's challenging. But I'm the type of person that I... I love to rally people around something like and get people excited about something that I'm excited about. And I've been that way my whole life. And that's kind of what fundraising is. And so, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's obviously lots of like rejection and stuff, but those times when people do want to support you is just like amazing. And so in terms of my career, I think that it's going to follow um, more so in the fundraising direction. Marketing is, um, <clears throat> I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. I've got some basic design skills and stuff, but I definitely, I don't, I don't know that it's my passion, but, um, but I, but yeah, I mean, that's why Wild Goose has been so great. Cause like I've been able to do everything. I'm the master of none, hundred percent. Right. That's why we have such great board members and committee members that like utilize their skills and resources and their profession to help, you know? So we, we are, I mean, we are very much like a working kind of, I would say like a, kind of almost like a startup, especially now that we're moving because it's like a blank slate and there's so many things that we can do, you know, in our, in our new space. So, yeah. so yeah, just like 
community building, all that. So we, we've talked so much about building these arts districts mm-hmm. and, and communities and then, you know, curating the cultures within those and, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Something that honestly has been on my mind a lot recently, um, given a, a project that I started to have a hand in, it made me think about a lot of other things. So um, without getting like too detailed, there is a project that I've had a hand in um, in creating like the, the kind of the visual campaign for to redevelop hopefully redevelop an arts district for a smaller town. So I really want your thoughts on how that sort of stuff works in smaller towns because, and I literally ask this because yeah. I, I am unfamiliar with yeah, it yeah. and it's something that fascinates me. I feel like it's easy to look at places like Columbus or Cleveland or Cincinnati or the bigger cities and you can see, oh yeah, there's totally an arts district being formed there. Cool. They're they're gonna redevelop a place and make it a North High. They're gonna, mm-hmm. you know, make a 400 West Rich. They're gonna do all these things where these places can can thrive yeah, yeah, and there yeah. there's an arts community there. Do I, I guess? How do I want to ask this? Do you think that those exist in a healthy way in smaller towns, or if they don't, why do they not? Because clearly, there's artists everywhere. Yeah. But, but why do you think it's such a strange, like, and maybe I'm explaining it the wrong way. Do you feel like there, there's a disconnect of like, oh, well, developing an arts district in a smaller town is such a harder challenge. Is it just because, well, it's, it's not a big city, but, but there still needs to be an arts community everywhere, right? Yeah, like, it, I think it, it, it all comes down to demand, too. Because if you look at bigger cities, you've got art schools, you have people that are moving to cities to do their art as a career. So it could just come down to the population of people seeking actual studio space. So I think just knowing the place that you're you know moving into and kind of like the 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 ecosystem of that place and and if there is a demand for artist studios and creative spaces but depending on what you're offering people may hear about it that live farther away and just go there because it could be a really cool space and something that's different or maybe they're tired of you know the day-to-day or whatever's offered in say Columbus so yeah, I think, it, but that's interesting, and I I don't really know, and I haven't studied the process so much of the of the decision making of the artist actually making that step to move into a certain location. Like, does the studio space is already kind of need to be there, and that's how they feel comfortable moving into that space, or is it just like word of mouth? See, I don't. I don't really, that, that's, that is an important step of the artist actually making that decision to move somewhere and then this creative ecosystem is like built. I mean, 400 West Rich is a perfect example. Like, I, I don't know entirely the history of it, but that building was renovated with the purpose of, of it being art studios. So like the art studios were made, built it and they will come kind of, kind of vibe. Mm-hmm. So. Do you feel like there's room for that, like, if you build it, they will come mentality in smaller towns. Like, cause we're, we're talking about like yeah, the supply and demand. Know. Like, do you feel like it's almost one of those things that you have to first give someone something? So then they realize, Oh, I did want well, this. It's kind like, of like, yeah, it's kind of, I guess now that you mentioned, it, it's kind of like what I talked about with the government creating that top down thing, but it's like so intense. Like they're literally building like a Columbus museum of art. That's just sitting there. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, for for example, in Songjiang Artist Village, it, it's a village. There's artists literally like moved there to work. So I think if you are going to offer something like that, then you need to have, or you might consider having places for them to live as well. So it, it I think what's really cool about an arts area that is in a smaller town or something like that is that that artistic spirit can really thrive in a place like that because it, there aren't market influences as much. But then they, after you create this place and the artists move in after a few years, oh, there's a coffee shop. There's a that, which is also positive too. So right. it's just like, it's weird. It's so weird. I, and that's why I find it fascinating. 
and that's that's the exact reason that I asked you those things. Yeah. Because, like, seeing these examples and, and learning more about it and seeing it happen, it just, it, it's, it literally makes me think, um, like, about my hometown. Like, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not going to grow to a Columbus or anything like that, for sure. But I'm like, well, what makes, you know, I, I know it's money and it's population and it's all these, mm-hmm. you know stuff that's way over my head but i still wonder like well what prevents these smaller places from still creating their own smaller versions of what these big cities have you know why can't my small town have a more thriving arts community yeah that's that's really cool i mean i would be curious to look into other examples of that in in other areas because i'm sure there are some but there's a lot of examples like that in china although it's hilarious. Um, my Chinese friends call Columbus a village. Really? Yeah, because it literally is a village compared to, huh? Compared to China, compared yeah. to just the population there, it's insane. Like, yeah, it's crazy. But um, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, arts villi- arts districts or arts communities in in smaller towns and rural towns would be would be kind of fascinating. I mean, I I would imagine like people would would move there for that or something like right. Depending on what the offering is, you know. Right, um, right. It's it, I mean, it just plays into that supply and demand thing. It's like which yeah, because I'm sure it works differently in different places. To be honest, like which comes first, you know, like is right. it is it you have to wait for the demand to be there so then you can supply it, or are there other places where it's like, I think if we just go ahead and make the supply it'll actually grow the demand because again, it's something that they didn't know that this needed. Yeah. 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 For sure. And that could be, I I am probably just imagining that and just wishful thinking of like, Oh, all these towns could just become these awesome things. Cause (laughs) I don't know how money works and funding and (laughs) you know, whatever. Like I know it's just wishful thinking on my part. Um, but it's just something that, you know, I don't think I'll ever dive deep into. But something that has recently been on my mind that honestly I feel like I have not had many people that I felt like I could talk to. Well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, too. It's just like the process of creating art versus displaying art. And in a place like, you know, a rural place, it just depends if if there is if people have money and they have a desire to to see art and go to things, then it could become like a place of of displaying art, too. But Sometimes there's places that are just better for creating art and places that are better for displaying art. And then there are some places that are good at both, which I would argue uh, 400 is good at displaying both. Because, like, they have those open studios. It's very accessible. You know, people can walk in and meet the artists and stuff. And then places like the Anderelli Room, Roy Bib, and now us that are largely dis- kind of, like, exhibit spaces in a way. Mm-hmm. So... I think those two things can be can be very different, right? You know. Right. So, but that's that's really cool. I, I maybe I'll do another thesis and research that. That would, and then I'll have <laughs> you back again. on. Never again. I'll I have you back never, on the podcast. I'm never we'll, going back to school. We'll talk about all of that. We'll talk about that whole other journey <laughs> the second time. Yeah. Okay. So, last question yeah. for you. I end every episode the same way by asking the same question. And it's, it's a big one. Okay. I'm so nervous. you can, you can answer it as simply or as deep as you would like, whatever it is. There's no right or wrong answer. So right now I would like for you to pretend that everyone in the world is listening to us talk right now. So they were listening to what you say that Mike is connected via these dirty <laughs> wires that we can't get rid of <laughs> to everyone else. Okay. Everyone in the world okay. can hear what you're saying right now. What do you want to share with them? I'm literally having a heart attack imagining <laughs> that. Um, okay. What do I want to share with the world? Appreciate art. And just know that art is sometimes hard to articulate, especially the importance of art. But in times of struggle, in times of happiness, in every single like moment of transcendence you were probably doing something art- artistically related so support local artists and learn about the arts in your city in your neighborhood in your town 
and figure out ways that, you know, it, it makes sense for you. And like art can be very accessible and it just makes your life so much better, really. So yeah, go and experience some art or stay home and experience some art, I should say. <laughs> I love it. That was great. That was like so nerve wracking. The entire world was <laughs> they listening. They just heard. They just oh heard what God. you said. <laughs> I'm just thing. imagining like this speaker like across the world. Just and everyone's <laughs> like, what is, what is, is that God? On? God? <laughs> Your name is Lydia? What are you That'd telling me? That'd be a good to... message though from God to experience art though. That would be an yeah. amazing message. I, yeah. I think even if they popped up and they were like, hey, just knock it off. I'd be like, okay. That's a, <laughs> yeah. also a great message. Like, that's pretty good. Bad. Listen, did you hear that though? Like, <laughs> okay, so Lydia, that was an amazing conversation. Oh, thank you. And I great. appreciate you so much for coming and doing this. Well, thank you for having me in this platform. Uh, it's so amazing. And if anyone wants to learn more about Wild Goose, you can go on to wildgoosecreative.org. Um, and I'm on Instagram and that was literally what All I was about this, to I am not on Twitter. Not on Twitter. You Deleting will not that Twitter. find me on Twitter. <laughs> or TikTok. Well, thank you for having me. This was wonderful. No, oh, and you just answered the next question that I was going to ask. It was like, where do you want oh. people to go check things out? <laughs> I know. Out? I'm so always just like, perfect. boom. No, yeah. you got it. Seriously, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. We're done. That's it. Oh, yay. We did it. All right, serious thanks out to Lydia for chatting with me and doing the show. Um, seriously, I think every new episode of this show is like my new favorite every single time I do it. Um, it just is. It just works out that way. I, I love meeting new people. Um, I, I love knowing that we sit down in this instance, like on this show, with the purpose of like sharing with each other and, and really truly getting to know each other. It's not just a random passerby moment. It's not a networking event where we're trying to sell each other something or anything like that. Um, I, I love hearing people's stories that otherwise, like let's face it, I or, or we, including you, probably wouldn't hear otherwise. I mean, I mean, you really think that you're sitting in an event and chatting with someone about their life story for two hours or something. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe, but I, I really don't think that that's the case. But I honestly do appreciate Lydia so much uh, for being down to do this and, and meet me for the first time on a podcast and, and share her story and, and all her thoughts and ideas and advice and everything that she did. Um, she seems like an amazing person. I'm glad that I've met her, and I feel like she made me honestly feel more confident and comfortable in, in getting further into the creative community here in Columbus. You know, I, I've lived here for... Uh, about six six years, maybe seven. I, I don't really know. I can't remember. Either way, six or seven years. And like I said at the top of the show, I'm not really the extroverted type. I'm not the one to really put myself out there and go meet people around the town and go to events and all these things that happen in the city, even though they're cool and they're amazing and, and I want to be more involved in them. Um, I just can rarely ever bring myself to do it to go meet people. So as I said, you know, my cheat code is using this podcast to bring them to me. Um, but truly... You know, Lydia, I feel like in this episode, opened that door a little more for me uh, and made me feel like that I'd be welcomed if and when the time comes for me to dive in deeper um, into the creative community here in Columbus. And I'll say this, if there are more people like Lydia in any creative community anywhere, then maybe, just maybe, people like me who sometimes feel like outsiders can and will find their place within that community if they're welcomed by people like her. So let's wrap it up. That was it, you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you watched on YouTube, thank you even more for taking that extra step. So make sure to subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, so you never miss an episode. Find them all. Follow it all. Uh, whether it's these full story episodes or my topic-based 15-minute Fridays, you can find them all on those platforms. For more constant updates, follow us at WYDHpod. You can follow me personally at Who's Ross Tyson. Tyson is spelled T-H-E-I-S-E-N. And of course, if you want to know more about Lydia, go check out Wild Goose Creative. So that's it. That'll do it for another episode, 31 of these things in the books, and many, many more to come, folks. So as always, I'll be back next time with another guest you may or may not know sharing a story you for sure never heard. <laughs>